It is written in memory and in honor of the victims and the survivors of One October, the 2017 Route 91 Harvest Music Festival shooting. And all of the royalties from this book, this is really important for me to share, they are going to the Vegas Strong Resiliency Center who supports directly survivors of that event. So um, that's important for me to share. All of the royalties are going there to support those folks. And the Vegas Strong Resiliency Center just does such amazing, important work for our Southern Nevada community. So I always like to, to mention them um, because they also accept donations directly. So that's another option as well. So um, about the poems that I will read tonight, I'd like to talk a little bit, just a little bit about some of the different forms of poems, if you can call them that. There are alphabet of grief poems that I will be reading. They are ABC variants of sorts that do not arrive at the letter Z, a reflection of both the untimely loss and of a community's need for language, as well as language's limitations to represent trauma, because both of those things I feel strongly are true. Some of the poems such as The Abandoned Napkin as a Collapsed Cloud are ekphrastic pieces, and they are written after David Becker's photographs of the concert grounds for Getty Images News. And most of the poems are anchored in our beloved Mojave Desert landscape, the severity and the beauty of which mirror griefs, incredible sorrow, as well as deep love, because both of those are true in grief. I know um, for myself, at least before I moved to Las Vegas, I had no idea what existed off of the strip. And Southern Nevada is truly one of the most gorgeous, complex, beautiful places, um, both in terms of place and people. And so um, I just have so much love for this place that, that I had to write this book. So here it goes. The tension above the water glass foreshadows the moon, just this once. The morning dove brushes the sill like a finger on a trigger. The prickly pear flickers silent in the late heat with flame like petals, snapshots of a moment, super giant stars as the sky has fallen and settles to the coral red floor of our still raw earth. Some things are meant to be seen, not touched, never heard. And so we wait, confronting pasts we cannot understand futures that can only be wrongly predicted. Nopales wave us forward, gestures of kindness when least expected, juxtaposed against the mountains, torn against deep blue, and those that came before. Even this desert was once an ocean. In an alphabet of grief, arching bonfires carried destruction. Each feather gasped, hills inverted. Just knowing love made night open, pushing quiet resolutions, stars tasted, unfractured. The abandoned napkin is a collapsed cloud which is to say we leave it behind. The sky is fallen and we cannot take it with us. The night exhaled, its lungs sunken to absence. Misshapen rooms light cannot enter. What might we wet with mother's tongues to clean the paper thin skin of messy babes mouths while ring fingers capture tears? trace faces. Who in the Mojave has not caught drops of rainwater on the beds that live beneath the roofs of our mouths? Empty chambers which hold our breaths. The abandoned napkin is a collapsed cloud, a prayer that we can see 
until it isn't. A thought we hope to decipher before snuffed out. A small breath billows before it fades. Beaks of birds emerge from crumpled paper. Concrete nouns shimmering against what we might pretend to see as a winter landscape. A failed anticipation of something new. Through proximity, what else have we forgotten? We wait the shape of this small home with roof more gentle than steeple tugging us toward the ground, asking us about the last time that we felt something truly. Beneath the gathering of leaves by whom we do not know, we find a tear stained something. This something in the leaves, in the heart of the woods, who are we to decide, finds itself shifted back and forth by the ground squirrel with paws so delicate they might hurt, or by the sharp heaviness of hooves, those of bighorn sheep, but never by the clear wind which cannot gain strength beyond the gentleness of a breeze. Here, in the dead of this joyful night, married for now to this a phrase so misunderstood. Oh, to be something that is undefined, to be something that is yet to be. I walk toward the hills and cannot remember your name. You warned me in the night I would forget the deepest angles, the sleep swept octaves of your voice. What else have I capsized? I dog ear pages to temper swollen verbs, phrases posing without shadow, moving forward without doubt. Our shared words now lifted like pollen skyward, becoming the stars. You deserve to be remembered. How can I keep hope drenched moments between curled hands? In this moonlight, a pause, a perspective, we become something better and something less. This grief returning again and again. Through rapture come undone, we sift through failing points of view. The sand breathes beneath the sky, respirations of sunlight as if settling like snow to the earth. There was a season of saying, yes. The aluminum can is a failing telescope, which is to say, we cannot go back. We see even Mars as it was 12 minutes ago, another red rock place where we have gone in search of water. There are so many metaphors for ocean and for loss. The city lights whisper washes, disguise the sky, slip man-made canopies over us, pretending to shelter us. The aluminum can is a failed telescope. One never tilted up and into this late night sky. The desert tortoise makes her way, not as if she could move mountains. She is the buttes and saddlebacks, and is too perfect to be a fixed part of this dust splash earth. She swishes sand, leaving wing shaped tracks, and on her back carries a detailed topographic map. The delicate lines, contours of relief, or Manifestations of the gaps we fill with silence and other absent declarations. Together we hear the hearty hissing and guttural grunts, warning us to keep our distance. We thought the tortoise was a snake, but we learn, even our palms, such unquiet basins, can ache. 
Can we talk about the clouds, you ask? In the sky, salmon meets fire orange against cyan blue, leaving small solero silhouettes, empty hands or shadow puppets of cold, toy, guns. We drive east just far enough to be one time zone farther. We wade for fuel and stop for fuel and we find some sort of white light. We pot cans of Campbell's soup, a water gun, a box of Tylenol and a superhero Kleenex box. We become today's postmodern desert outlaws, a strange vying I would never wish on anyone. We are silently drowning one moment at a time, and it is always to that same goddamn that's not love song, which leaves me wondering what is set to repeat. But oh, honey, yes, there is water still here in the Mojave. You tell me about the excitement of igniting a tumbleweed. And I think of a cage turned outward, protecting empty space within. I contemplate what we should do only in a controlled environment or not at all. Bring me all of your worst ideas. What I mean is, let's roll them all across this once ocean floor beneath the clouded ripples of our sealess sky and away. At night, the desert dusts itself off and century plants continue to bloom like stars, like stars burn. How can we learn to abandon what has already left us? We keep secrets so well while the desert heat sinks unknowingly through us. Your hand a basin lifted up from this earth, brought skyward and emptied of rivers, of pond, of gravity. For this, a quiet kind of love. Promise me you will go on. Feel the percussion of tears, the moon as emptiness, traced and brimming with promise, because both can be true. With dreams being antlers we shed with whims outside of our control. With the fox's tufts of hair being silky pairs of beds within hungry, prayer-like ears, distant and open for broken ideas, once gorgeous. Thank you so much, folks, for listening. I'm so grateful to each of you. And thank you again, Summer, for everything. Thank you. Thank you with all my heart. Heather, I, I got your book and I spent some time with it and I super love it. I, I don't really want to go after you, but um, I feel like one of the things I love about this book is that every line is like a world. And that's, that's how I feel about it. Like every line is like a writing prompt that I could like go on forever and just super be in love with. So I am honored to share the space with you and um, your book is super important. And I'm gonna read about smaller problems than like gun violence. I'm gonna read about um, bad lungs and bad, bad relationships. Um, I have cystic fibrosis. I was diagnosed as adult and uh, so I wrote a book about it because that's what I do. <laughs> um, all right, and y'all cut me off when, I'm gonna read a couple poems from the book. Oh, this is the book, Who's Gonna Love the Dying Girl? Oh, look, some of you have it. Um, and, and then I'm gonna read a couple of new ones and then I'll have you on your way. Um, thank you to Unsolicited Press. Um, I'm going to say a, a quick thing about like, I had actually given up on ever getting this book published. Like I had sent it out. It got rejected, 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 rejected. No one wanted it. No one wanted it. And then like, I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll still try. And I 
found, and I don't even remember how I found it, but I got to the unsolicited press website and anyone who knows me will know this is how I found my home. It said, no bullshit, just books. And I was like, fuck yeah. Sorry, children in the room. Fuck yeah. That's, these are the people I want to put out my book. And I sent it to them. And thankfully we felt mutually the same way about each other. And I'm super grateful. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And I looked at, I mean, I didn't just send it. I looked at the books and I was like, all oh, this looks like great. I love it. And yeah. Okay. Thank you. My friend Andrea is telling me that her child is okay with hearing my bad words. All right. I'm going to start out with the opening poem in this book called A Litany of Bad Decisions, which could be also my autobiography. A Litany of Bad Decisions, part one, omens. The only remaining correspondence between the two of us, a New York Times article about Marfa and a reply of yippee, John Krakauer's Under the Banner of Heaven on audiobook, Mormonism, Blood Atonement, a six hour drive through desert, the first gallery with photographs of Katrina's destruction paired with poems by children left in her wake, something beautiful repurposed from storm, but still destruction. Part two, take it all back. Some farm to table restaurant with a name that involved chicken and electricity where you bring your own wine, a loud sophisticated couple, middle-aged couples tipsy and deep, deep in conversation, us silent, draining everything we brought. A bar afterwards, a folk singer finishes his set and we talk too long about Club Passim. We meet a couple and you tell them you're from Brooklyn and I say, but you're from Connecticut. All of your drinks on my tab, scotches piled upon scotches, then a Milky Way themed trailer that sells grilled cheese. You screaming at me from a beanbag chair, everything misshapen in black light and so twisted I walk out and back to our rental alone through pitch black streets with no real sidewalks. Who's gonna love the dying girl? It all unravels, a smashed phone, a disconnected call, an overturned coffee table, a locked bathroom, chunks of my hair unmoored. Part three, aftermath, triplicates of paperwork, a gas stop, a guy on a Harley with a sympathetic look, and then, cheap sunglasses, a legion of bugs sacrificed on my windshield with no substance in the world other than sheer will to scrub them off. Six hours to forget, I'll leave you in a shallow grave in West Texas. Um, this next poem, maybe, I don't know how old the audience is, but there's that movie Mask, Sharon Eric Stoltz. Love the movie. This is a poem that references the movie. And if you haven't seen it, it'll still make sense. But if you have seen it, cool. The split second where it begins and splinters outward. There is that sharp moment when you first feel pain, when the initial sting stabs through your nerves and turns into everything you've ever done wrong in your entire life, distilled into throbble, into tangible throbbing. In the photograph the cop took, it begins with a few slashes of red, a puffing, not that bad. The next day, everything is deepening, swirls mark green and purple. I think about that scene in Mass where Rocky is trying to teach the blind girl about color. She's been blind since birth, has no concept of what colors mean. He wants to show her, leads her to the kitchen, heats up a stone places it into her unsuspecting hand and says, this is red. He takes another stone from the freezer and says, this is blue and for green, he, he presses a clump of moss into her open palms. He puts her own hands to her face and says, beautiful. When she asks to feel his disfigured face, he hesitates then relents and says, it feels okay to me. I used to think this moment when she presses the contours of his face was perfection. Now, I want her to be able to see his face 
and still say it's okay. Later on, I touch my own face where yellow slights along edges, and I can't remember exactly what hit where and at what angles. Um, I do a lot of eavesdropping in writing, and this is a poem that came out of that. The ever-present pink sky. In a coffee shop, a man says the girls in his daughter's kindergarten are slicing each other up. One minute, Susie is their best friend, and the next, she's over it. The boys, they start then. One day, she's all about Liam and Solomon, and the next, they're over Liam and Solomon. In poems, God, God's hand reaches into your puppet body before you die. You have no control. Somewhere on a balcony of a once glorious hotel with toilets that run too long, you're trying to find where a relationship ends. At your feet, neon pink Mardi Gras bees, a discarded plastic tiara, crickets dead in corners, beautiful crystallized shells. You try to relish cracked paint on doors and shouldn't crack paint be enough? Something splintered from its intention to stunning pattern. Having children thinks you makes you think of your own mortality. And I think dying makes you think of your own mortality. Um, okay. I'm gonna read some sick girl poems. <laughs> this one, um, when you have cystic fibrosis, you go to a children's hospital. I don't know if you know that. It's because people with CF don't um, live that long, but now they do. And I'm on this beautiful gene cure medicine and everything's great. But I wrote these poems when it wasn't. So this is called In the Waiting Room of the Dell Children's Hospital CF Clinic at age 40. The Disney princess pictures and Finding Nemo posters haphazardly tacked up at registration cubicles where nurses wearing cartoon scrubs remind you of the fact you are supposed to be dead by now. Even your medicine reeks of childhood, Asian hamsters. Imagine a tiny syringe extracting secretions from their genetically engineered ovaries. Remember that fragile hamster you owned for three days? It got cold and it died, water removed from flame. But that one death, you cried more than all the others, not because you knew it best, you loved it best because it was the most beautiful. Is there some kind of strange beauty and slowly dying of a child's disease, but not knowing until decades later? You never got out of gym class or to make a wish to meet Damien Rice or top the other girls' sob stories at Whitney Shoemate sleepover when they kept playing Richard Marx's hold on to the nights and crying. How do we explain something that took us by surprise? Now, you can't remember if you had nothing to share because you're not really a joiner or because you walked in late and they were already crying. All right, um, I don't know if you all have, uh, well, okay. If you've seen the movie Five Feet Apart, they made a CF movie that was kind of good because Cole Sprouse is in Riverdale, he's super cute. Um, but I don't know, there are some things about it that irked me. Um, so I had a student who cataloged the lives of tropical fish and he shared his nerd journal with me once. He called it his nerd journal, I didn't call it that. Um, and I wrote a found poem on it and expressed my anger at this movie a little bit. <laughs> so this is for my student, Matthew. Uh, this is how it is. In the young adult book turned movie about my disease, they keep describing the tubing, how the main character still looks cute with cannula up her nose. The author labors over vials of hypertonic saline and strategically organized med carts with cupfuls of crayon, pages of flow vents and afflow vents to ensure authenticity. When they kill the unnecessary character to prove the disease is terminal, he is just a slight blue on the floor, unmoving while the nurse weeps over his body. But there are only two mentions of phlegm and even those are treated like delicate renderings, nothing deep green or thick or bloody or draining down someone's face or coughed up 
so hard the patient vomits all over themselves while sitting in traffic. I wonder why there's no scene where the main character shits herself while using her shaky vest and has to shower and clean her sheets before rushing to work where a student shows his nerd journal where he catalogs the daily care and lives of his tropical fish. And I think, yes, this is how it is. As I read his description of a molting porcelain crab who is swarmed by nasarious snails because they smell death and so they rip both claws from his soft shelled body. Um, okay, I have some people here who are from my hometown. So shout out to Massachusetts because I think this poem, like I read it for some Texans recently and I don't think that they knew that this was a thing that you could do. It's called The Lobster. Nigel regrets his rap days. I make mixes of emo songs I loved 10 years ago. In Texas, he's divorced and I'm dying. But back home, there's him in a tracksuit performing in Kim Sherry's, Kim Shorey's basement. And then there's me loving it. I'm Rob Bass and I came to get down. This is what adults do. Drink too much, stay up too late, steep in nostalgia. But what if we could operate in some other space between the gray area where people still send letters and steal bowling balls? Once we tried to set a grocery store lobster free. He hid it in his trench coat. We left it for someone who owned a saltwater tank. In the morning, the guy called and asked, did you leave a dead lobster in my car? What if we are the place where good intentions go awry? Some of these poems I got to read in the accent, which I've lost over the years, but you know, it's still there. All right, um, read a couple more and then I won't keep you too long. This one's called Providence. There is a sign in the lobby that reads fine and unblinking neon. The day before you arrive, I don't notice. After you're gone, it's there, suddenly constant, freakishly pink. The hotel bartender from Kansas tells me he builds large scale sculptures. He's trying to reconstruct the one room schoolhouse his mother taught in on a field outside Providence. Later, you and I will run through a downpour back to this bar where you tell me you changed your mind then turn me around, push me into an elevator. You'll say, I don't wanna share your attention. I wanna tell you, I know about parasites or maybe I know how the body can betray itself. 10 years ago, a San Francisco hotel in a twin bed. I remember the texture of your undershirt and it shaking so slight, I might've imagined it. I want to say, I understand how the body can tell the truth even when you don't want it to, even when you try to force it not to, it won't lie. It won't let you lie. All right. Uh, this is a poem I wrote. My mother died four years ago and I spent most of my life um, like at odds with her. And then when she died, I felt unmoored, but um, she died around the same time as Tom Petty. And this is a poem that I wrote about that. And some of my high school friends and some things I did when I was young. The ever living ghost of what once was. Imagine Tom Petty and my mother, the same age sharing a scorpion bowl and whatever semblance of heaven I've assembled to make myself feel better. There was that day on our front steps when I was eight, where she stepped on a grasshopper I told her to avoid. She didn't listen and crushed it. When I flipped, my father said, Gail, she tried to tell you. I built a house for that grasshopper out of a matchbox, but really who has actual wooden matches and a matchbox? Is there a ghost in my house? One night I came home with my friends completely high, maybe drunk as she backed out or to Toyota Camry of the driveway to look for my father. I leaned in the driver's side window, expecting to be in trouble, but she said, go into the house, I'll be back. Everything's going to be okay. A few days later, I came home at dawn, tripping with hot, fresh donuts from the grocery store. 
My dad left without a word because he had traffic and manual labor to deal with. My mother heading to the hospital where she worked muttered something like, you're gonna get it when I get home. But I decided that morning in a fog of dough and acid, I'm an adult. If I wanna come home at 6 a.m. with my dude friends, then it's fine. We huddled in the basement, watched Troll 2 out of pinhole eyes, freaked out and in love, like when you're night swimming and you remember there's a dead cow at the bottom of John's pond or that you got away with being fucked up because your dad was cheating on your mom, that no one noticed you were crying in that sliver of a bathroom or that you were making out in the backyard with a boy who had a prison tattoo of some other girl's name on a or that the trampoline had a tear halfway through it and soon someone would fall through, break something and it would totally be all your fault. All right, so um, I'm gonna read like two more and these are not in the book. Um, and one kind of book ends, one that's in the book. Um, and I appreciate those of you who realize that my poems are funny because um, a lot of people told me my book was really heavy and sad. And I was like, but it's funny. But I guess um, not everyone has the darkest sense of humor that I have. <laughs> so, okay. I don't know what I'm doing here. All right. Uh, this one is a line stolen from my friend Jill Alexander Esbaum, who's an amazing poet and a New York Times bestselling author. And she gave me the line. And so I like it and I took it. It's called The Best Bad Idea You've Had in Months. It always comes after too many Mexican martinis. This one comes a few days before you decide to return to the desert. You think you need closure. And so you send this message soaked in olive juice and tequila. If I'm ever gonna move on with my life, we have to have a conversation. The next morning he replies, same. Then adds an hour later, those were dark times and how sobriety and therapy helped a lot. Life is good. As the conversation moves on, there are phrases like, what happened between us? He thanks me for not pressing charges. Weeks later, I'm in a pop-up bar in the West Texas town where a decade before everything went wrong, black lights bring neon psychedelic posters to life, swirls of purples and blues illuminate a photo of Conway Twitty. Dirty, fuzzy carpeting glows itself clean. Judy make friend makes friends with a German woman who came to get away from a bad man and an even worse divorce. She opened a cafe where she bakes bread to forget the controlling man who was able to take her daughter because he had money and she didn't. This is the way things are in West Texas. They pop up, get blasted with artificial light that makes everything seem better. And then they drop out of existence as if they've never happened at all. The lighting is the same as it was a decade before. And in the silences of the loud music, I could still his, hear his voice say, I know you're only 88 pounds, but you look hot. And I remember a green bruise from where my face met an ottoman. The next morning, he woke up at home alone and didn't know why. Did I do that to your face? Those were dark times. Life is good, but I'm still here in this misshapen light, staring at this woman sharing her pain, her eyes glassy with memory. On the way back to the hotel, I stare into a Mother Mary statue glowing in a spotlight in front of a church and wait for everything to shift back into focus. Sorry, that was a downer. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna read a, a poem, okay called the night sky is vanishing and um it's 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 very new england in a way i guess uh it's not new england my grandfather was an elk so these like old grandpa clubs intrigue me i used to go there as a kid so i'm still very intrigued by them it's called the night sky is vanishing my mother told me the boys climbed through the bathroom window to get into her sweet 16. everyone wanted to get into that potty it was the potty of the year. 
She told this story for years and years. Janet admitted she opened the window for the boys to get in. In my backyard at night, I looked skyward at all the stars that were blotted out by light pollution when I lived in Boston for all those years. And I imagined boys climbing through a tiny window at the Elks Club in Arlington, Mass. Janet guarding the door in a chiffon party, party dress holding their hands as they stepped down onto the toilet and into the party. My grandfather policing the door between hands of poker. These days, I lay on the floor of my garage staring at a disco ball, following the paths of mirrored light all over the ceiling as new orders leave me alone, plays on repeat. I reach back through decades of blackouts and locate the moment when memory chipped and fragmented. I try to figure out how some stories solidified and repeated and others turned to smoke, rose up and dispersed, tried to find pattern in what I remember and what I've forgotten. Over 80% of Americans can no longer see the Milky Way. Sky glow obscures our place in the universe. In the night sky of my mother's sweet 16, the only boy she really wanted to come was turned away and he left, not realizing the upstairs window was open. Okay. Okay. So this poem is um, called The Giant Cocktail. Uh, it won third place in a contest recently, which is the most money I've ever been paid for poetry. Actually, no, I got paid to write some poetry for some standardized testing and that paid more. So second most. If they layered disappointment like fondant, folded it over in rich layers, then maybe it would at least be gorgeous. Lord knows that shit doesn't taste good. And it's not meant to, rarely is something beautiful on the inside and out. It's meant to hold shape, mimic magic, an edible wonderland, entire world steadfast in sugar. You hold on to this principle, keep buying face masks and concealers for the bags and the dark circles and the dulling skin and hope it will bring back all of the people you loved from the dead or lessen the scars on your lung or give you back all of breath you need to climb stairs without struggle. And then he tells you he sleeps in his makeup and you warn him. You tell him what it'll do to his pores. You tell him there's a charcoal mask he might need. And he said, it's fine to sleep in makeup just once. And you think, how fucking naive. Because you can pinpoint the sunburn from this past summer where you got drunk on Zima, passed out on a neon pink float in your two foot backyard pool and fucked up your forehead one mistake and indelible lines assault you forever. But you weigh the damage against this. You floated, listening to Bell and Sebastian in the backyard of the house you now own, trying to remember the first time you snuck a Zima. Or maybe you didn't have to sneak it because the owner of Al's Pizza let you try it. It was new. You had that first sip and thought, this is nice. You didn't have lines then, but there was the grease of the pizza shop in mid-July, coupled with the New England waterfront air, both so thick they clung to your white polo and wouldn't let go until they left their mark in Bacchny. All right. I'm going to end on uh, this sort of happy poem. During the pandemic, I became obsessed with the Monterey Bay Aquarium live cam. I don't know if any of you watched it, but it shows you what, yes, Maya is like about this. So I would like, you know, I couldn't leave my house. I had cystic fibrosis. I was stuck there. Everyone, everyone was like, stay home, Brie. You're going to die. And so I stayed home and I became obsessed with the Monterey Bay Aquarium live cam because I love an aquarium, but also I love like the live cam brought me life and I was obsessed with these otters. So this is called Bright Water Days. There were bright water days where everything felt feverish and you snake through them, coiled and deliberate as a rattler. 
the flowers you stole from the neighbor's yard and kept in small jars all around your room made you believe in grace. You were rich back then, felt hope deep in your bones, but now even your bones are disappearing, shrinking each year, all that promise seeping and hollowing out until you're as light as a hummingbird. But even if you could rise up and out into thin air, it's riddled with everything that could kill you. One deep breath could suck in all the dangerous colonies you fear most. You will not become Superman. But this morning, you watched otters from across the country for hours on a live webcam. You were transfixed as they cut silky loops through briny brown water. You believed in their joy as they tossed candy pink buckets into the air. You believed in love as they swam twisted around each other. You even felt it inside your empty bones. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Thank you.